What does the Bible say? My people are dying for lack of knowledge. I like the Afrikaans translation. I know you won't understand it, but it sounds so nice. It says, My folk gaan ten gronde aan een gebrek aan kennis. Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> Somebody said Afrikaans is not a language, it's a throat disease. My folk gaan ten gronde. My people are going, you can't translate it, going to pieces, falling apart, being obliterated, being annihilated, being crushed. All of those are in that sentiment. It's a very nice translation. And so I'm afraid some of what I'm going to say might, you know, for some might sound, well, it's getting a bit technical now. But we have to understand these languages that are being spoken out there and what it's all about so that we can understand what these people are actually doing. You know, isn't this the year when the Pope was in America? Isn't this the year when he spoke at the United Nations? Isn't it? And what did he say? Nobody knows what he said. He said nothing. He said nothing. Or that is what people think. And I read what we write about what he said. And you know, there was nothing. Folks, there was lots. But we didn't know what he said. So we're going to have to get a little bit technical and just see where they stand and what they actually teach. I've titled two lectures, They Have Made Void Thy Law. Part one, which implies that there will be a part two. Right, so there will be two lectures on this issue, interposed with another lecture, which I hope will be finished for this series. And uh, it has a weird name. I like weird names. I haven't quite decided yet, but I think I will call it the Beamable Sustainable Princess. Whatever that means. <laughs> but we'll first talk about they have made void thy law. Psalms 119 verse 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. God will intervene in the affairs of men when his law has been done away with. And the question is, how close are we to that event? Well, it takes two lectures to even discuss this. Lamentations 2 verse 9. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. So the law is very much tied in with what God is all about. Don't mess with my law. It is cast in stone. This Protestant writer writes, Nehemiah humbled himself before God, giving him the glory due unto his name. Thus also did Daniel. Daniel wasn't afraid to be seen praying at the window. It was his custom to suddenly stop, would send the message that the authority of king, the king was higher than the king of kings. Let us study the prayers of these men. They teach us that we are to humble ourselves, but that we are never to obliterate the line of demarcation between God's commandment-keeping people and those who have no respect for His law. So let's have a brief look just at the first few verses of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel says, Then I set my face towards the Lord God, to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. 
We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, to our fathers, and all the people of the land. We have sinned. We've paid no heed to your commandments. We've ignored your prophets. This is the prayer, and Daniel is a type of the people at the end. His name means judgment, the people of judgment at the end of time, the standard of judgment, the law of God. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. They're going to make void God's law because Satan hates the authority of God. He loathes it. What a prayer was that which came forth from the lips of Daniel. What humbling of soul it reveals. The warmth of heavenly fire was recognized in the words that were going upward to God. Heaven responded to that prayer by sending its messenger to Daniel. And this our day, in this our day, prayers offered in like manner will prevail with God. The effectual, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. As in ancient times when prayer was offered, fire descended from heaven and consumed the sacrifice from the altar. So in answer to our prayer, the heavenly fire will come into our souls. The light and power of the Holy Spirit will be ours. That faith stopped the mouth of lions. That faith can still stop the mouth of lions today. But there is a sad reality that when you stand for righteousness and truth and when you stand for Jesus Christ, for what he is, you will have the winds of strife. This planet is covered in blood as a consequence of people who stood for righteousness and truth. This is one of Martin Luther's sayings. Where Christ is, there he always goes against the flow. Wow, that's true. If you stand for what is true, you will have the wind blowing at you. God has placed certain laws and standards into the world for man's happiness. It is when we violate these laws that unhappiness abounds. God has also arranged his creation so that each organism fulfills its purpose. And when we disrupt this purpose, the Bible says in Romans 8, 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. We're in trouble. This planet is in trouble. Our faith is based in nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. It is true that we violate the laws of nature. Revelation 11, 18 says, And the nations were angry, and they watch, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name small and great and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Now this is not only in terms of the physical environment, pollution. We hear a lot about that these days, don't we? Oh, the planet is in a terrible state, and it is. But the Bible says the planet will wear out like an old garment. And is this hype that we are hearing in the world today, is it part of a plan or what is going on there? We'll be talking about that in the next lecture. I want to talk about how we violate God's order. And I know that there will be some sensitive toes here in the midst of this audience and in the world. And it is not my idea to pray, play the patriarch or the know-it-all. But God has a certain order of things. Genesis 1 verse 28 says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over everything living thing that moves upon the earth. Who has dominion over the planet? Man has been given dominion by God himself to be over this planet. Sure, 
there are those who misuse that privilege. But God didn't put the earth over man. He put man over the earth. Now if you go to the Gaia hypothesis, according to John Verne, James Lovelock formulated the Gaia hypothesis, which today is known as the worship of the earth, and it propagates holism, and that perverts and inverts Genesis 1. And we will see that the devil has succeeded in perverting and inverting and eradicating every single aspect of God's order, including his law of Ten Commandments. We violate the role distribution. Genesis 1:27. so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And ladies, he created Adam first. I'm sorry. And genetically, Adam has every gene it takes to make a woman. But a woman doesn't have every gene it takes to make a man. She doesn't have a Y chromosome. And this is the order that God has placed in it. Why? To lord it over the woman? God forbid. God accepts nothing but free will offering. God doesn't coerce. God doesn't force. He says, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I will not force you. I will not make you worship me. It is when we understand the character of God that of our own free will, we bow the knee to him. Because that's the only offering that's acceptable. A free will offering. A love that is forced, is of no value whatsoever. Should my wife love me because she has to, God forbid what a miserable marriage we would have. If she loves me in spite of what I am, and I can be a pain in the neck, believe me, then it's valuable. It has intrinsic value. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Isaiah 43, verse 6 and 7. We are in the image of God, both male and female. And don't you mess with the image of God. Genesis 3, 16. Something terrible happened. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Ooh. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And life has been a misery ever since. And men believe that they must lord it over the women until the women rebel and lord it over the man. Isn't this what we have in the world today? And we don't understand this order. And what a miserable sentence. And we equate it with childbirth. Childbirth is a momentary thing. Even if it is a few hours. Even if it is 21 hours, even if it's 24 hours. But what is that compared to this new life that's in your hand that you can cuddle and raise to the glory of God? Nothing. This has nothing to do with childbirth. This has nothing to do with conception and the pain thereof. This has to do with mindset. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. This has to do with training the mind of a child. And with the rebellious spirit, every mother knows how much prayer it takes to raise a child to the glory of God these days and what the dangers are. They are incredible. So the woman has been endowed with the task of raising children to the glory of God. And she will be doing this with sorrow, with many, many tears. And her desire will be for her husband. Why? 
Thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. By the sweat of thy brow, thorns and thistles it will produce. That's what the Bible says. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till you return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Death sentence. We will all die. What's the mindset of the man? I am a provider. I have to provide for my family. So the mindset is, I must go and work by the sweat of her brow. So now all of a sudden where they were together, now they are separated. How many women say to the husband when he comes home at night and the kids have been difficult, we are never there to help me. Where were you when the kids did this, 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 and this? Her desire is for him to be there and help with this task, but he's off. He's working. His mindset is to provide. You take that mindset away from the, mind, from the man and you force him into another mold. He can do it. You take this mindset of nurturing away from the woman and give her another task. She can do it. There's no question about it. She can do everything a man can do and she can probably do it better. She can multitask. The man can only monotask. <laughs> this is about a mindset. And this is the mindset of the woman. And that's why children cling to the skirt rather than to the pants. And even religious people understand that. That's why they create this goddess image. That's why they create a Mary image. Because we tend to want to run to the mother. My son... I always get into trouble because I always get his age wrong because I don't know, for some terrible reason, it changes every year. <laughs> He's about 23, I think, maybe. Am I, am I, am I going to get clobbered? 24. Okay, I'm in trouble again. <laughs> 24. And he'll phone to this day. And he'll say, can I speak to mom? And I say, what's the problem? Can, can I speak to mom? And then I give mom the phone, and then he'll say, Mom, I've got problems with my car. <laughs> what am I supposed to? I could kill him. <laughs> Why would he do a thing like that? I mean, surely he should ask me what to do with his car, right? No, he, he asks, can I speak to mom? This is the mindset. Mothers are nurturing Mothers are the ones who do these things well. But today we turn it upside down and we force the opposite mindsets on the people. And that is why suicides are increasing exponentially. And as we take the role away and shift it, so we become obsolete in our mindset and very often... Men can't handle it. Men are committing suicide at a rate such as never before. If you take industrialized nations where there is this turnaround, like in Japan, it's just unbelievable. And the husband shall rule over you. Well, history shows that men have been unreasonable, but that's not what God meant. Matthew 20 verse 25 says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they are, that they are great, those that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so amongst you, but whoever shall be great amongst you, let him be your minister. Wow. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Wives, obey your husband. Is that blind obedience? God forbid that that should be blind obedience. The two are equal partners. Christ never forced, never coerced anyone. I'm totally free. How many marriages have absolute freedom? Very few. Either one or the other is often in bondage to the other. And as long as it stays like that, the marriage is, in inverted commas, happy. 
but tug at the chain, and all hell breaks loose. Isn't that so? As Christians, we need to give freedom like Christ gives freedom. So we are inverting the role distribution in the world today. And the breadwinner today, the one who is out by the sweat of the brow, is often the woman and not the man. I'm not talking about singular, single parents. You have no choice. You can do it all. In the Humanist magazine, its author Ryan Eisler says, talking about equal rights, it is absurd to say that one is a humanist but not a feminist. Feminism is the last evolutionary development of humanism. Feminism is humanism on its most advanced level. We have to be feminists. Humanism then is really based on feminism, evolution, atheism, and communism. Wow. Where is this leading to? Here is the Rural Development Institute. These are the official governmental organizations. And they say women represent over 50% of the world's population and provide 60 to 80% of the world's agricultural labor. Yet some research indicates that they own less than 5% of the world's land. Assets and income in the hands of women results in higher caloric intake and better nutrition for the household than when in the hands of men. Good grief. <laughs> in other words, if the house is in my name, we eat worse than when it's in her name. Have you ever had such rubbish in all your life? But this is the indoctrination that is taking place. So now we need a shift. Instead of doing things together... We now have to shift it from the one to the other. All we are doing is changing poles. We're getting nothing right. And then you can read about this women's property rights, increase women's status and bargaining power within the household, secure land rights, provide women. Here is an incentive, a mode of action to turn things on its head. Here is uh, the United Nations Interagency Network. Women hold the key to reaching developmental goals. Megiro efforts to meet international development goals must focus on empowering women. I have nothing against empowering women. There's nothing worse than treading on any one of the two sexes. But to change it completely around and to have dominance of the one over the other is wrong. And to turn it around and have the other dominant over the previous is just as wrong. We're not repairing anything. We're not getting it right. This is not Christian. And here you have the UN service, and this is Secretary General Asha Rose Megira, and she's writing, efforts to meet, this is 2008, efforts to meet international development goals must focus on empowering women. So this is what the media is talking about. Empowerment, 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 empowerment. Empowering one means automatically what? Disempowering the other one. So here we're seeing a shift, a role reversal. Empowering women is not just an end in itself. It is a prerequisite for reaching all the millennium development goals. Our common vision to build a better world in the 21st century. So the vision is to turn it on its head. That's not an improvement. If they would say, let's share it equally, that would be nice. But now we're going to turn it upside down. To achieve this was crucial to promote affirmative action, human rights protection, leadership training, Apprenticeship programs for young women, women's manifesto of political priorities, all of these issues. And you have all these mega organizations coming into, into play in the world to achieve these goals. And then you have these interesting developments, recovering and reclaiming ancient ways to heal our lives, the sacred circle, which is coming into religion in a mega way in the world is self-supporting sisterhood of like-minded women dedicated to reclaiming the goddess and committed to healing of our lives. So we have to come back into contact with this goddess motion. Luciferus is the feminine gender of Lucifer. 
When, a woman, when the women heal, the earth heals. We gather together in the spirit of love and trust to share our recovery, discovery, and empowerment. Our primary purpose is to provide unity and support to all sisters who are reclaiming ancient ways to heal from the insanity of sleeping humanity and the unconscious insidious ways of patriarchy. You see where we're going? We're just turning it on its head. And we're going back to the worship of the earth. We come together to share our personal stories, identify common problems and solutions, pass on the many benefits gained by honoring a goddess-centered spirituality. We don't even know what we're doing. And all of the ancient ways and all of the pagan ways are becoming vogue and coming into the vocabulary of mankind. And we have all of these clubs where men and women just don't connect anymore. I speak to my sons and I say, you know, I think like a male. Sorry, but you know, it's just part of my Y chromosome problem. And uh, I say, you know, that's a nice girl. Oh, no, no, Dad, I can't, I can't ask her. She has to ask me. Huh? I, I just don't get it. I'm old-fashioned. But the world is upside down. Or haven't you noticed that the world is upside down? Have you noticed it? So we're not only inverting the role distribution and keeping the separation while we do that, we also violate God's law. Wow. Isaiah 24 verse 5, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Would we go so far as to not only attack role distribution, but actually attack God's law, His authority? Well, the Bible says that the little horn power, Daniel 7 verse 25, would think to change times and laws. He would actually do it. The reformers identified this power as who? As the Roman papacy. Did you change God's law? The Pope says the Pope has power to change times to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. This is their own writing. We can change God's law. The Roman Decretalia say he can pronounce sentences and judgments in contradictions to the rights of nations, to the law of God and man. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. What arrogance. What arrogance. The Pope's will stands for, and now we have to be very careful how we read these statements. Every word is loaded. Every word, every action that goes up for people to see has a message. And we have to figure out the message if we want to understand how Satan is setting up his kingdom. The Pope's will stands for what is that word? Reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. Pope Nicholas quoted in Facts for the Times. I want you to file the word reason. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Sin, what is it? Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So here is another God on earth who will take the power unto himself to negate that which God has said and change it for something else. The man of sin. What's the definition of sin? 1 John 3 verse 4. Whoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is transgression of the law. So the man of sin must have a problem with God's law. Right? By definition he must have a problem. 
Well, let's see what Roman Catholicism has done with God's law. But that's not it alone. We have to understand why he did it. And how does it affect me? And how does it affect you? Well, I'm going to compare the, compare the Bible, and I'm using the King James Version here, with the Roman Catholic Catechism, the current one. Catechism, Articles 2052 to 2557, regarding the law of God. Let's read the commandments in the Bible, and then we'll compare them to Roman Catholicism. And then we'll see how it is changed, and why? Because it's going to be based on what? Reason. Good word. Well, the first commandment says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Roman Catholic Catechism says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. Well, what's gone? That's gone. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. If you want to be a universal ruler, and you want to unite all religious systems, then a law based on reason cannot accommodate a very specific reference to the deity that you're referring to. Are you with me? So to say, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, is very specifically the God that the Jews worship. So that excludes the other deities. So it is politically inconvenient to have this very specific reference. So let's remove it and only say, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So then you solve that problem. The second commandment says, thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the fourth, uh, fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God is not here saying that he's going to punish the children for the sins of the fathers. He's merely saying that the example of the parents just happens to filter down to the next generation, unfortunately. Now, if you want to be a universal king with universal power, then how would you change the mindset of all the idolatrous nations that do exactly this? It is impossible. So this law is highly inconvenient. So what do we do with it? Well, why not just remove it? And so the Catechism of the Catholic Church, based on reason and common sense, removes it. It's gone. Now the plot really thickens. The third commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. In this lecture, I'm not even going to discuss the relevance of all of these things. I'm going to do that in a later lecture. Remember there's a, a part one. There's a part two. I'm just going to speak generally about the law in this lecture. Now the second commandment in the Roman Catholic Catechism says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What's gone? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. This admonition is enforced in the law of God and is softened in Roman Catholicism. Well, that's interesting. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's amazing that the two longest commandments in the Bible have been the most drastically changed. In fact, more than 70% of the law of God has been removed by Roman Catholicism. The third commandment in the Catechism reads, Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. So what's been changed? Well, that big chunk is gone. Six days shalt thou labor, and everything that pertains to it is gone. And the first bit, the Sabbath day, has been scrapped and replaced with the Lord's Day. Fascinating. I wonder what their purpose is. Fascinating. Let's go to the fifth commandment. It says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Catholic one says, Honor thy father and thy mother. So what's been removed? The promise. If you are faithful in this commandment, this is the commandment with a promise, says Paul. The promise has been removed. Now it is a promise without a, com a commandment without a promise. Well, then they stay pretty much the same, the sixth one. But of course, they're always one out now, right? Because they've removed the second one. So the fifth one will be the fourth one in the catechism. The sixth one will be the fifth one in the catechism. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. Unchanged. The seventh one becomes the sixth one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Unchanged. The eighth one becomes the seventh one. Thou shalt not steal. It remains the same. The ninth one, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. It remains the same. Now they only have nine commandments, so they better get their act together to get ten. And the way to do that is to take the tenth one and split it into two. But notice what they do. The tenth commandment reads, Thou shalt not, and, and this is very important, because nothing is chance. Nothing. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Split it into two in the catechism. The ninth one reads, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife. And the tenth one reads, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. What's gone? Well, let's check it out. Your house is gone. Okay. You can keep your wife. Whew, that's a relief. <laughs> the people working for you, your employees, they're gone. Your manservant, your maidservant, they're gone. Your ox and your ass, they're gone. Now, what would be the equivalent of an ox and an ass today? The ox was the one with whom you did your work. A direct translation today would be your tractor. But a general translation would be your implements of work. They're gone. Your ass would be your transport. Is gone. You've lost your house. You've lost your workers, you've lost your implements, and you've lost your mode of transport. Wow. Interesting. Very interesting. Now let's go to the next step. I'm not going to repeat my previous lecture series. If you want to have more details on what happened in the French Revolution, then go and look at the DVD called Revolutions, Tyrants, and Wars. In my previous one, human rights versus the law of God. The great philosophers of the French Revolution, the Voltaires and all of these, and the great instigators, the planners, the Weishaupts, 
What were they? And who were they? They were all Jesuits. They were Jesuits. And they are the think tank behind the French Revolution. And after the French Revolution, the first declaration of human rights was presented to mankind. And the effrontery of all things is they put it on two tablets of stone. That's like saying it's going to take the place of the Ten Commandments. And then they put a fasciae, a bundle of rods tied together with a spear through it in the middle. And then they had their little serpent with a tail in its mouth, a Ouroboros. When I switch on my new computer, I have to look at Ouroboros every single day, going ying, 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 ying around there. I don't care. I'm using it to do the Lord's work. <laughs> and there is the triangle, the all-seeing eye of Lucifer. And today we have human rights, human rights, human rights, human rights. But Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. Nope. We have something else. So here is the original human rights declaration. Let's read Pius the. 11th citation. Under fascism, property owners may keep their property titles and deeds, but the use of their property is, at, as Leo the 13th wrote, common. Fascism is a form of socialism that retains the forms and trappings of capitalism, but not its substance. Under fascism, property titles and deeds are intact but the institution of private property has disappeared. Government regulations and mandates have replaced it. For this distinction between legal ownership and actual use, the fascists owe a debt to the Roman church state. Okay, so you may have your property, you may have your title, you may pay your governmental fees on whatever you own, but it's not yours. In fact, the car that you drive has a disc on it normally which says that you have paid your taxes. The car is yours by lease on loan. You can either lease it directly or you could pay it all in a lump sum, but it's still on lease. It's not yours. And neither is your house. It's under a social mortgage. So the French Revolution has these Ten Commandments over here with this bundle of rods, the fasciae, and then if you look at the top of the spear, you have this funny little hat, which is the Phrygian hat, which is the hat of the French Revolution. Now some of this is in greater detail in my previous lectures, and I'm not going to repeat them, but if you want to know the origin of the hat, then you will have to go to the god Mitra, and Mitraism is the heart of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is Mitraism. It is Persian sun worship. It is not Christianity. And there is the Persian sun god Mitra, who is the one who killed the bull with these all unclean animals helping him to do it. And there is little hat, his Phrygian hat. So you put this little symbol in there, and everybody thinks, what a cute little hat. No, you are honoring Mitra by wearing it. And then liberty leading. They took liberty and they took this woman, this prostitute. They brought her in tremendous fanfare to Notre Dame, to the cathedral, enthroned her as the goddess of reason. Ah, we're back to the word reason. The Pope's will stands for reason. Now we've seen that he's changed the Ten Commandments and there is a reasonable reason for changing them. And now we have replaced the authority of God within the church by a reasonable action and we bow to the goddess. We've seen in the inversion of Genesis 1 that the goddess was also made prominent. And women are deified to the form of a goddess. This is all very interesting theology. Actually, it's a Luciferian theology, 
but we'll get there. So here the French enthroned her as the goddess of reason, and if you will note, there was the blazing sun emblem of the god Mitra above her head, the venerable day of the sun. Now, 1948 to 1998. This was the great acceptance of this principle on a universal scale. And it's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted and proclaimed by General Assembly Resolution 217A3 of 10 December 1948. Here we have human rights as the basis for human morality enshrined in universal governance. On December 1948, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted and proclaimed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the full text of which appears in the following pages, blah, blah, blah. This is their own webpage, the UN webpage. So human rights is today international morality. This year, 2008, Pope Benedict waves to the United Nations General Assembly. April 18, 2008, at the United Nations in New York, the Pope reminded all UN member states of their duty to protect their people from grave and sustained human rights violations. Oh, the Pope has become the champion of human rights. Remember, he's Jesuits instituted, instituted it in the first place. Fascinating. It was the most televised thing that has happened. And the red carpet was rolled out. Can you see it over there? And heaven forbid that a piece of dust should pollute the holy feet of the Holy Father. So let's vacuum it before he arrives. What an affair. There he arrives at the United Nations. Everything is prepared. The Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, and the Pope seen together waving to the crowds as they move towards his great speech. And the newspapers flash it out. Pope addresses global audience at the UN Pontiff, says human rights the key to solving many of the world's problems. He's the head of a so-called Christian church. Shouldn't he champion God's law? No, he's championing human rights. New York Pope Benedict XVI told diplomats at the United Nations on Friday that respect for human rights was the key to solving many of the world's problems. Okay. The pontiff addressed the UN General Assembly on his first papal trip to the US, said the organization's work is vital but he raised concerns that power is concentrated in just a handful of nations. Oh, he's always championing the underdog. Multilateral consensus, he said, speaking in French, continues to be in crisis because it's still subordinate to the decision of a small number. Broadening his base. Let's look at another news. Pope touts human rights at UN denounces go-it-alone superpower strategies for global problems. New York Pope Benedict yesterday upheld the human na United Nations as a crucial defender of human rights and a force of peace, while warning that unless those human rights are considered God-given, they will be subject to erosion and revocation. Whoa! Let me just, let me just stagger a while and, and get around to this one. Human rights are now what? God-given. They are God's law. This is fascinating. Which God are we talking about? Certainly not the God of heaven. This is another God. And these laws are God-given. Well, let's continue. They will be subject to erosion or revocation. They are God-given. Nobody may take them away. They're standing in stone. In one of the most anticipated stops on his U.S. tour, Pope Benedict told the U.N. General Assembly that the rights encoded in the U.N. Universal Declaration of Human Rights apply to everyone, 
by virtue of the common origin of the person who remains the high point of God's creative design for the world and for history. Sounds marvelous. The man's making a great speech, but wow, what's he saying? Pope Peter's green at the UN. Pope Benedict highlighted his recent environmental campaign, so he's now a green pope. Actually, he looks like a white pope, but never mind. And then he says something fascinating. He says, the forms of life on earth must not only guarantee a rational use of technology and science, but must also rediscover the authentic image of creation. The Pope argued that environmental protection is a moral obligation. Okay, human rights is God's law, and protecting the environment, this is the new agenda, is now a moral obligation. Now let's go further. Another, this is the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, reporting another part of the speech. He says, these human rights, they are based on the natural law inscribed on human hearts and present, present in different cultures and civilizations. Okay, now we have a cross-cultural law. And it's based on, what did he say? What is his buzzword? Natural law. Now, you know, most people wouldn't even notice what he's saying. They would say, well, that sounds very nice. They are based on natural law. Inscribed on the human hearts and present in different cultures and civilization. His six-day visit was in response to an invitation, blah, 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 as Pope Paul said, da, 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 da. And then he says, human rights, the Pope said, are the key to world peace and security. So now we're learning something more. It's God's law. It's based on natural law. Well, let's look up natural law. We'd like to know what he said. Wikipedia, I know it's not the best source, but you can check it everywhere, and I'll give you lots of other sources which are very, 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 very relevant. Greek philosophy, talking about natural law, emphasized the distinction between nature, physis, on the one hand, and law, custom, or convention, nomos, on the other. What the law commanded varied from place to place, but what was by nature should be the same everywhere. A law of nature would therefore have to have the flavor more of a paradox than something which, was ob which obviously existed. Aristotle is often said to be the father of natural law. So natural law theology is based on reason and is universal. Whereas God's law is very specific, it's not universal, and therefore God's law will have to be changed, although it's written in stone and may not be changed. The man of sin would change God's law and replace it with another God's law, human rights, and it's based on natural law. Well, what are you saying? Contemporary Catholic understanding, the Roman Catholic Church holds the view of natural law set forth by Thomas Aquinas, particularly in his Summa Theologica. So now we're getting technical. Did the Pope say nothing or did he say everything? Let's have a look at the Chronicle of Higher Education, Roman Catholic source. Chronicle Review, The Intellectual Advantage of a Roman Catholic Education by Alan Wolfe. He's a Jewish professor at Boston College from the issue dated May 31, 2002. Among Catholic intellectuals, as well as some who are not Catholic, the most important inheritance is the natural law tradition. Wow. Now a Roman Catholic Jewish professor is saying the most important inheritance is natural law. So now it's not just a word. Now it's something important. I better know what it means which is premised on the idea that there are certain truths in the world that remain true irrespective of whether the laws and conventions of any particular society adhere to them. And its worst belief in natural law can lead to ideological rigidity and inflexible humanity, but at its best, respect for natural law gives one the self-confidence that makes possible the passion and curiosity that fuel intellectual inquiry. 
So, woo, this sounds magnificent. Natural law, in short, inoculates us against postmodernism. Catholics are likely to hold that the truth of God's existence must mean the truth of man's reason, arts, beauty, morality, universality. Now, where does this come from? Where does this stuff come from? Here is Professor of Moral Theology, St. Patrick Seminary, California. He writes a book, Reason Informed by Faith. Reason Informed by Faith. And he writes... Natural law is central to Roman Catholic theology. The advantage of using natural law is that the church shows great respect for human goodness and trusts the human capacity to know and choose what is right. Ooh, are you beginning to see something here? The Bible says, of our own selves we can do nothing. The Bible says the whole head is sick. Only in Christ can we be elevated. Thomas Aquinas said, no, 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 no. No, we might be fallen physically, but our reason is unfallen. And because our reason is unfallen, we can make decisions equal to those of God's law. By reason, we can actually change things. So Roman Catholicism teaches that man is fallen, but his reason is unfallen. Especially the reason of those who are supposed to reason for those who cannot reason because they think that those others, the goyim, are too stupid to reason. So natural law says that the one who rules by divine right is the one who makes the decisions. The advantage of using natural law is that the church shows great respect for human goodness and trusts the human capacity to know and choose what is right. Also, by means of appealing to natural law, the church can address its discussion and claim for the rightness or wrongness of particular actions to all persons of goodwill, not just to those who share its religious convictions. Are you getting me now? So I must change God's law so it becomes a universal law then I replace it with human rights, and then I say anybody who does not go along with that has not got goodwill. And a person without goodwill shouldn't deserve to be around. The magisterium has appealed to natural law as the basis for its teachings pertaining to a just society, sexual behavior, medical practice, human life, religious freedom, the relationship between morality and civil law, so how much of your life will be controlled by natural law? All of it? All of it? In any case, the development of natural law tradition amongst Christian thinkers is due not so much to the scripture as to the influence of Greek philosophy and Roman law. Wow. The beast was like unto a leopard. And the leopard beast represented who? Greece. This is Greek philosophy. This is the superior philosophy of the elect elite over the goyim, those who should not have the capacity to do these things. So Roman Catholic natural law is derived from the premise that reason is unfallen. Protestant law of nature embodies reason subdued by the word of God. Here are two opposing theologies in the world. Isaiah 1 verse 5. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Roman Catholicism says, no, the head is not sick. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Romans 7, 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth. What does Paul say? No good thing for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Rome says no. I can correct and change God's law. I can correct what the apostles wrote. I am their superior. What arrogance. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. That's Christianity. Romanism is paganism. 
If reason is unfallen, then we can save ourselves by reason. Moreover, natural law also requires the sacrifice of individualism to collectivism. You have to knuckle under to the reason of the reasoning power. Otherwise, you are not a good citizen. So when the Pope said, human rights are based on natural law, did he say nothing or did he say everything? He said everything. He said everything. The Jesuit, Murray, writes, Natural law regards the community as given equally with the person. Man is regarded as a member of an order given by God and subject to the order that makes the order an order. There is therefore just a right way, but no rights, and right is decided by wrong. Now that's fascinating. Under natural law, I become a number, and I cannot rise above the wish and the will and the thought pattern of the community. If I should dare to pop my head above that and think as an individual, that head has to be lopped off. Are we seeing more and more control of that nature and that decision-making capacity is being taken away from man, yes or no? Here's the address of His Holiness Benedict to the participants of the plenary session of the Congregation for Doctrine and Faith. And it's called Dignitatis Humanae. Informing their consciences, the faithful must pay careful attention to the sacred and certain teachings of the church. For the Catholic Church is by the will of Christ the teacher of truth. It is her duty to proclaim and teach with authority the truth which is, which is Christ and at the same time to declare and confirm by her authority the principles of the moral order which spring from human nature itself. Wow! The principles of the moral order spring from human nature? I thought the principles of the moral nature come from God and His law. Here we've turned something upside down. This is extremely dangerous. And the church will decide what you must believe. But Benedict XVI addressed the University of Roma. What did he say? 2008. The Pope is first of all the Bishop of Rome, and as such in virtue of apostolic succession from the Apostle Peter, he has episcopal authority in regard to the entire Catholic Church. The word, Bishop, Episcopos, which in its immediate meaning refers to supervision, already in the New Testament was fused together with the biblical concept of shepherd. I am your supervisor, I am your shepherd. You will do what I say. This is the Pope speaking, not me, I'm just reading it. He is the one who from an elevated point of observation, I'm so glad I have someone on an elevated point of observation, who can decide for me what is right and wrong. What would I do without it? <laughs> Surveys the whole landscape, making sure to keep the flock together and on the right path. This description of the bishop's role directs the view, first of all, to within the community of believers, but this community that the bishop cares for, as large or small as it may be, lives in the world. Its conditions, its journey, its example, its words inevitably influence the rest of the human community in its entirety. Thus the Pope, precisely as the chap shepherd of his community, has increasingly become a voice of the ethical reasoning of humanity. We have another God on earth. He will decide what is right and wrong. And you had better listen. The Pope speaks as the representative of a believing community in which throughout the centuries of its existence, a specific life wisdom has matured. I like this. So his life's wisdom has matured in the church. He speaks as the representative of a community that holds within itself a treasure of ethical understanding and experience which is important for all of humanity. In this sense, he speaks as the representative of a form of ethical reasoning. Good grief. Insofar as the reasonable mechanisms are concerned, he notes that the issue cannot be reduced to a mere struggle for who gets more votes, but must include a process of argumentation that is responsive to truth. 
wahrheitssensibles Argument Argumentationsverfahren. Good grief. I've just said it in English as well. And then he relates it to Thomas Aquinas observed a special place in history for highlighting the autonomy of philosophy as well as that of the law. He equates, well, and it goes on and on and on. This is fascinating stuff. So here is a morality that has developed in the church and its pinnacle and power lies in the Pope. Martin Luther, this is a Reformation series. He talks about Schriftenprinzip, which is Bible principle, what is written in the word, the word principle. So Luther's word principle was the axiom of Protestantism, just as the Roman churches say, Führerprinzip, leadership principle, was the axiom of Catholicism. So here we have two opposing religions. The one says, I am the Führer, I am the leader, I am the one who will decide what is moral and what is right. And on the other one, you have the Schriftenprinzip, the word-based principle. The Bible is the standard of morality. We have a choice to make, people. Luther wrote, we should learn to separate spiritual and temporal power from each other as far as the heaven and the earth. For the Pope has greatly obscured this matter and has mixed the two powers. I love the reformers. Phew. Someone's still thinking. This reform, reformation writer says the very beginning of the great apostasy was in seeking to supplement the authority of God by that of the church. Rome began by enjoining what God had not forbidden and she ended by forbidding what God had explicitly enjoined. That's well put. Martin Luther says, if you do not contend with your whole heart against the impious government of the Pope, you cannot be saved. Whoever takes delight in the religion and worship of popery will be eternally lost in the world to come. If you reject it, popery, you must expect to incur every kind of danger, even to lose your lives, but it is far better to be exposed to such perils in the world than to keep silence. So long as I live, I will denounce to my brethren the sore and the plague of Babylon for fear that many who are with us should fall back like the rest into the bottomless pit. Wow. The gloves are off. Martin Luther talking about the Schriftenprinzip, the Bible, the word-based principle. He says... Putting aside all human writings, we should spend all the more and all the more persistent labor on the Holy Scriptures alone. Or tell me, if you can, who is the final judge when statements of the fathers contradict themselves? In this event, the judgment of Scripture must decide the issue, which cannot be done if we do not give Scripture the first place so that it is in itself the most certain, most easily understood, most plain, is its own interpreter, approving, judging, and illuminating all the statements of all men. Therefore, nothing except the divine words are to be the first principles for Christians. All human words are conclusions drawn from them and must be brought back to them and approved by them. That's Protestantism. We don't have Protestantism in the world today. We have fascism. John W. Rodden's writes, magnificent book, if you want to read it, it's called Ecclesiastical Megalomania. He writes, each man should be required to give an account of the deed he had done on earth, and therefore each man had the right to read the Bible for himself. So was born the individualism that transformed the communal ancient and medieval worlds. Individualism, standing before God as the author of your deeds and being judged by the mirror of God's law. Thomas Ehrenzella, director of World Federalists, asserts, a growing number of people are sponsoring a backlash against the wave of religious fundamental fanaticism. The right course to take is that which will lead to a new world of unity and world law. We want another law 
We want a universal law, and that cannot be the Bible law. It has to be another law. The Humanist Manifesto, too, boasts, we deplore the division of mankind on nationalistic grounds. We have reached a turning point in human history where the best option to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to move towards the building of the world community. We must lose our individualism. We must become immersed in globalism. We, the members of the United Nations, solemnly proclaim our united determination to work urgently for the establishment of a new economic international order. That's the UN Monthly Chronicle. A new international order? Uh, do you think that this crisis at the moment could have something to do with that? Do you think it's possible that your house... <laughs> which Protestantism always guaranteed that your possessions and all of these things are now under threat. A complete change in the world's financial and economic order is imperative, Benjamin Cream, spokesman for Maitreya. The land and that which it produces belongs to humanity as a whole. And the time must come when the basic needs, foodstuffs, etc., etc., are equitably distributed by a central economic council we're moving in a very interesting direction. Blair launches Faith Foundation. Hardly had he escaped from his prime ministerial role. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair launched a Faith Foundation to tackle global poverty, challenge conflict, and unite the world's religions. On the basis of what? On the basis of Christ? Impossible. Impossible. So the new agenda has something else in mind. Tony Blair converts to Catholicism at service in Westminster. Is he setting a precedent? Is he setting a precedent? Tony Blair has converted to Roman Catholicism, the former Prime Minister's official spokesman confirmed today. Mrs. Mr. Blair and Mrs. Blair, here they are with the Pope. And what a beautiful handshake. I like that handshake. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> I like it. No, it's very interesting. <laughs> BBC. The next one to take over from him is Mr. Brown. Hmm. Brown reveals global moral vision. Gordon Brown has been setting out his vision for a global society governed by shared moral sense. We are not moral strangers, but they are shared moral sense common to all of us. Here he's speaking to none other than the religious assembly of the church. And the prime minister urged nations and religions to act together to solve problems. And he addressed the general assembly of the church of Scotland. We need a shared morality. Fascinating. The Bible says they have made void thy law. And it's time for God to act. Telegraph. George W. Bush meets Pope but claims he might convert to Catholicism. Oh, not another one. <laughs> Is he going to do it? The whole world is becoming Catholic. What a nice discussion these people are having. And what is the battle that he fought for us? Well, let's see. Condoleezza, can you help us? Jacobinism. What was that? That was the French Revolution. The Jacobins were formed by Adam Weishaupt, who was a Jesuit. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice used the February 8th speech in Paris to extol the Bush's administration, global democratic revolution, which he says continues the work of the 18th century French Revolution. Okay. The French Revolution replaced God's morality with another morality. The Pope comes to New York and he says... This morality, human rights, is God-given. Did he say that? It's based on reason. I'm just recapping for you. It's based on natural law. I hope you are beginning to see everything that you ever were slowly disappearing in the sand. Can you see it? Now, what is this French Revolution that you are continuing and who are you using in order to further your actions? Well, obviously, 
his military power. Here is the Department of the Army, United States of America. Oh, what is that funny little hat doing on the emblem of the armed forces of the United States of America? Is he completing what the French Revolution began, yes or no? I want to tell you tonight that what began there is the all-out war against the God of heaven. It is the dethroning action of the sovereignty of God to be replaced by the sovereignty of another God. And it's going to be universal, and nobody can stand in its way. And if you dare, you will have that little Phrygian hat come down on you like a ton of bricks. Now, let's go to the papal documents. Pius, writing in 1931, declared that rerum novarum, however, stood out in this, that it laid down for all mankind unerring rules for right solutions of the difficult problems of human solidarity, called the social question. Thank you, Pope Pius, you are telling us that the encyclical Rerum Revarum will tell us what the right solutions for mankind are. Now John the 23rd in his Mater at Magistra wrote, by far the most notable evidence of the social teaching and action which the church has set forth through the century undoubtedly is the very distinguished encyclical letter Rerum Novarum. I want to know what that document says. Because it's going to tell me what the right solutions for my moral choices are. Isn't that what they're saying? So I'm going to bore you with rerum novarum. I know I did it in a previous lecture as well. I only touched on it. I'm going to do it in a little bit more detail. Because whether you like it or not, this is you and me that is being categorized and put into a package which might suit the papacy, but I wonder whether it will suit you or me. May God help us with this new morality. Here is the greatest encyclical, and I want to tell you now, this is universal law. Rerum novarum encyclical. To our venerable brethren, the patriarchs, blah, blah, blah. I've only taken parts of it, so I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. For every man has by nature the right to possess property as his own. That's Article 6 in Rerum Novarum. By what? Please note their wording is always very carefully chosen. By what? Nature. Hence man not only should possess the fruits of the earth, but also the very soil inasmuch as from the produce of the earth he has to lay by provision for the future. Man's needs do not die out, but forever recur. Although satisfied today, they demand fresh supplies for tomorrow. Nature, accordingly, must, give, must have given to man a source that is stable and remaining always with him, from which he might look to draw continual supplies. Now, this is written a long time ago, but it is the economic thought of the Roman Catholic Church, as the popes have said. Isn't that sustainable development? Have you heard the word sustainable development? Wow. So don't miss my lecture on the sustainable. No, the beamable sustainable princes. Article 10 says, as effects follow their course, so it is just and right that the results of labor should belong to those who have bestowed their labor. So if somebody has built a car for you, who does that car belong to? It is common. It is not yours. It's common. That's why the ox and the ass are removed from the Ten Commandments. With reason, I've highlighted that word, then the common opinion of mankind, little affected by the few dissensions who have contended for the opposite view, has found in the careful study of nature and in the laws of nature, natural law, the foundation for the division of prophecy. Here is the Pope. He said at the UN, human rights are based on what law? Natural law. We approach the subject with confidence and then they use the capital us and we 
They're God. They're God. They're going to decide for you what you must believe. Article 22. It is lawful, says St. Thomas Aquinas, for a man to hold private property, and it is also necessary for the carrying on of human existence. But if the question be asked, how must one's possessions be used? The church replies without hesitation in the words of the same holy doctor, man should not consider his material possessions as his own, but as common to all, so as to share them without hesitation when others are in need. Can you see why the 10th commandment had to be changed? Is it beginning to make sense? Is he the man of sin, yes or no? Yes. Article 27, and if human society is to be healed now, in no other way can it be healed save by a return to Christian life and Christian institutions. So human society is sick. Protestantism is sick, according to them. When a society is perishing, the wholesome advice to give to those who would restore it, to call it to the principles from which it sprang, Catholicism. Hence, to fall away from its primal constitution implies disease, to go back, recovery. In the Middle Ages, nobody owned any land, only the feudal lords owned land, and the church oversaw it all. The church has guarded with religious care the inheritance of the poor, which is what belongs to you. The common mother of rich and poor has aroused everywhere the heroism of charity. Sounds so nice. By the state we understand any government conformable in its institution to right reason and natural law and to those dictates of the divine wisdom which have expounded on the encyclical on the Christian constitution. Every state has to comply with natural law which is a Roman Catholic law which is governed by the Pope. So now let's have a look what he says in Article 33. The public administration must duly and solicitly provide for the welfare and the comfort of the working classes. Remember, they don't belong to you. You may not say that you have control over your workers. That's in the Tenth Commandment, but that's gone. To cite the wise words of Thomas Aquinas as the part and the whole are in a certain sense identical, so that which belongs to the whole in a sense belongs to the part. Amongst the many engraved duties of rulers who would do their best for the people, the first and chief is the act with strict justice, with that justice which is called distributive towards each other and every class alike. Redistribution of wealth. Have you heard that term? Where's it come from? Now you know where it comes from. As the power to rule comes from God, and as it were, participation in He's the highest of all sovereignties, it should be exercised as the power of God is exercised, you will not be able to say no. You will be in big trouble if you say no. Whenever the general interests in a particular class suffer or is threatened with harm, which can in no way, other way be met or prevented, the public authority must step in to deal with it. We'll have more and more intervention by public authority in our private lives. You will have to apply in triplicate if you want to go to the toilet. <laughs> Rights must be religiously respective wherever they exist. And it is the duty of the public authority to prevent and to punish injury. Whew, we're going to have laws. We don't know where they're coming out of ears. The right to possess private property is derived from nature, not from man. And the state has the right to control its use in the interests of the public good alone. Why do you think the state is so happy to intervene in the mortgage crisis? Are they taking things into their own hands? Who owns you if the mortgage crisis has been taken over by the state? The state owns you. And who owns the state? That's another interesting question. Wow! This is fascinating. This is fascinating. It says the state may not absorb the land for itself. Now trade unions, the most important of all workmen's, working men's unions. Such unions should be suited to the requirements of our age, an age of wider education, different habits, numerous requirements. It is gratifying to know that there are actually in existence not a few associations of this nature consisting either of workmen alone, blah, blah, blah. We want workers' unions, workers' unions. For to enter into society of this kind is the natural right of man, and the state 
has for its office to protect natural rights, not to destroy them. And it forbids it, if it forbids its citizens to form associations, it contradicts the very principles of its own existence. So state, we will have trade unions, and they will take care of the needs of the workers and not of the others. They will be excluded. And state, you keep your hands off because we own them. Who created the trade unions? Well, if you go into it, you will find the instigators are in the ranks of the Jesuits. And now listen to this absolute arrogance. And here we are reminded of the confraternities, societies, and religious orders which have arisen by the church's authority and the piety of Christian men. The annals of every nation down to our own day bear witness to what they have accomplished for the human race. It is indisputable that on the grounds of reason alone, such associations being perfectly blameless, huh, in their object, possess the sanction of the law of nature. So these Christian orders, they are based on the law of nature. State, you will leave them alone. You will not interfere in the affairs of the church. You will leave your fingers off. We are the boss. In their religious aspect, they claim right to be responsible to the church alone. The rulers of the state, accordingly, have no right over them nor can they claim any share in their control. On the contrary, it is the duty of the state to respect and cherish them, and if need be, to defend them from attack. Wow! Wow! Let the working men be urged to lead to the worship of God, to the earnest practice of religion, and amongst other things, to the keeping holy of Sunday and holy days. Who proclaims these holy days? The church... Let him learn to reverence and love Holy Church, the common mother of us all. Excuse me, you're not my mother. <laughs> from this follows the obligation of the cessation from work and labor on Sundays and certain holy days. So here we have workers' rights instituted in rerum novarum, and it carries on and on and on. And the state has no right to interfere, and the property belongs to the church the state only has distributive rights, not ownership rights. It gets fascinating. Pope Leo, in regard to the church, her cooperation will never be found lacking. And then it goes on and on and on, and here is the encyclical. You own nothing. The church owns everything. Everybody is subject to it. What the papacy has realized is that by constantly enlarging the rights of man, to use the Vatican's own phrase, it can offer ever more new moral arguments for enlarging the size, scope, and power of government. Gaudium et Spes, one of its encyclicals, one of the major documents issued by the Second Vatican Council, is typical of the many pronouncements of the church states. Interesting. The following is a long, though incomplete, list of man's rights as they have appeared in the various papal encyclicals since 1891. These are some of the new rights that require intervention by government in all aspects of society and economy. This is the Roman Catholic Church writing. Huh. Let me take a breath. Right to freely found unions. Right to culture. Right to immigrate. Right to immigrate. Right to food. Right to clothing. Right to rest. Right to medical care. Right to wage. Right to life. Right to environment. Safe environment. Right to personal security of workers. Right to family life. Right to private property. Common use of goods. Uh, right to common use of goods immediately after the right to work, right to pension, right to insurance, right to association, right to security, bodily integrity, blah, 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 strike, right to strike, right to found a family, right to education, employment, reputation, respect, appropriate information, protection of privacy, right to freedom, professional training, equality education, blah, 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 on and on and on. Now, if you have all those rights, how much government intervention must there be to secure those rights? Absolute control. That is why you cannot hire and fire. You cannot make a decision in terms of your business. You cannot even decide whom to employ. Do you know that it is against the law for a specific church to employ only members of that church? Which might mean that if you are a Christian, you might have to employ a Muslim preacher very soon. 
I mean, this is getting ridiculous. The complex circumstances of our day make it necessary for public authority to intervene more and more often in social, economic, and cultural matters. Already in 1874, the British Prime Minister Gladstone stated, note his words, individual servitude, however abject, will not satisfy the Latin church. The state must also be a slave. Does that include the United States of America? Does that include Canada? Does that include South Africa? In 1904-1905, a non-Catholic German socialist, Marx Weber, published an essay in which he spoke about Protestant ethics. And he said, those countries whose economies had grown most rapidly were Protestant. And those whose economies had lagged behind were Roman Catholic. Felix Rachenfall pointed out six ways in which Protestantism had fostered economic growth. Protestantism permitted intellectuals, intellect to be devoted to secular pursuits, not just religious. Protestantism brought education to the masses. Protestantism didn't encourage indolence. Protestantism championed independence and individual responsibility. Protestantism created a higher form of morality and Protestant separa separation of church and state. These are the things which were good. In all these respects, Rachfal wrote, Protestantism produced a liberating, stimulating effect upon the economy, economic life. But Catholicism, a constrictive and obstructing one. This is a fascinating letter. Dickens wrote it. And he wrote it to Mr. Foster. He says, In the Simplon at the bridge of St. Morris, where the Protestant canton ends and the Catholic canton begins, you might separate two perfectly distinct and different conditions of humanity by drawing a line with your stick in the dust on the ground. On the Protestant side, neatness, cheerfulness, industry, education, continued aspiration of the better things. On the Catholic side, dirt, disease, ignorance, squalor, misery. I have so constantly observed the like of this, I first came abroad, that I have a sad misgiving that the religion of Ireland lies at the root of all its sorrows. According to canon law, the control of the property of the Roman state belongs to the Pope, its supreme emperor. He controls all property. The Roman Catholic doctrine of private property is echoed in the communist slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to the need, his need. And if you think about it, that was the Lyndon Johnson watchword. Human rights are more important than property rights. It was the creed of Lind Lyndon Johnson's society we shall take from the haves and give to the have-nots who need it so much. It's in fascism, Nazism, liberation theology, interventionism, and socialism. This is what we have in the world today. I want to take you back in the Bible. I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 21. There's the story of Ahab, Naboth, and his vineyard, and Jezebel. And the location, Jezreel. Ahab represents, in typology, the kings of the world. And he looks out the window, and Naboth's vineyard looks glorious. But he can't get it, because it belongs to Naboth. Because God's law says, you shall not covet thy neighbor's house, you shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, not his ox, not his donkey, not his workers, nothing. You have no right to interfere. <coughs> Amazing. And he wants it. And then Jezebel comes to him. And Jezebel, in the New Testament, is a symbol of the fallen church, the one that leads into sun worship. And she says to Ahab, I'll give it to you. I'll get rid of that pesky little Naboth. And so she had him murdered. And Ahab got what he wanted. That's a type of what will happen on this planet. Naboth is murdered for his vineyard. Have you read the newspapers? How many Protestants are being driven off their land? Have you studied what's happening in Zimbabwe? 
Have you studied what's happening all over the world? Here they're just being more subtle. You're all going to lose it. And the community is going to get it. 1 Kings, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Nahab and Ahab said, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it will give, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. And he went to his house sullen. Oh, what an interesting story. Well, I told you the story. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Protestantism gave liberties to the world. Arise, Protestantism is dead. Take the vineyard. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Set your affections on things above and not things on the earth. I have learned in my country, where we feel this thing every single day, where people are being murdered by the thousands, driven off lands, I have learned to accept it's not mine. And if they take it, they take it. And if they want my car, they can drive it. If they think they need my television, they can have it. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. And this is my encouragement to you. I'm not like those preachers who say, let's stand up and change it. You cannot change it. We've lost the war. But Christ hasn't lost it. So set your affections on things above. When they have made void his entire law, he will act. The Bible says so. I believe it. And if our affections are above, then great. Luther declared, My strength and my consolation are in a place where neither men nor devils can reach them. Isn't that great? Oh, I love it. Christianity is not a crutch. It's a cross. But without it, we have no hope. Our hope is based on nothing less but Jesus and his righteousness. Let's think about what he has prepared for those that love him. And then it won't matter what it happens. What happens? Then you can take the newspaper and instead of blowing a gasket and having a coronary or a stroke, relax and watch the world go by as the great end time battle unfolds. And remember, Jesus is the victor and he has promised, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and I will come again to take you so that you may be where I am also. Thank you.